Good morning. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. I don't know if I've ever admitted this or not, but about seven and a half years ago when Dan and I started recording 40 Minutes in the Old Testament, true to the spirit of the Old Testament and Abraham, I had no idea where we were going. In fact, uh, truth be told, I had, when we started recording that podcast, I had not listened to a single podcast episode of any podcast whatsoever. I had no idea where I was going. Well, now here we are, almost eight years later. I added it up, about 334 episodes, 222 recorded hours later, 12 biblical books down the road, and we're still moving forward. Except I'm fairly sure I know where we're going now. We're going to Malachi chapter 4, the, the last book of the Old Testament. And if my estimates are correct, we should get there about the time that my beard is fully gray and I'm about ready to retire. So 40 minutes of the Old Testament is actually my job security. <laughs> so early on in this podcast, of course, we started talking about Abraham, the Abraham who went out not knowing where he was going. You know, in this thing called life, it seems like the going part is really not the hard part. The hard part is the not knowing. I mean, we're always going, right? <laughs> we're, we're always going forward in time. 30 minutes from now, you're going to be 30 minutes older. Maybe a few hairs fall out, some skin cells fall off. We're always, we're always moving forward. The planet on which we find ourselves is moving. We're always going forward. So that's not the problem. The real question is, do we know where we're going? Now, it seems to me that God is in the business of doing two seemingly contradictory things when it comes to this. Number one, he does want us to know where we're going. In fact, Abraham found this out. We were told that Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose builder and architect is God. So the city of God, that's what the patriarch plugged into his GPS. That was the destination, the, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven. It's the, it's the zip code of resurrection life. Let me tell you where there is no Zoning for cemeteries. Can I get an amen? amen? Thanks be to God for that. So yes, number one, the Lord does want us to know our final destination. And number two, at the same time, God seems intent in an obvious and, and frequently a sort of painful sort of way to, to bring us to that destination in the most ridiculously circuitous route possible riddled with, with potholes and, and flat tires and road construction and reversals and, and all of these things along the way, every conceivable mishap that we can imagine. In fact, it, it feels at times like, are we going to make it? I mean, are we actually going to make it to that final destination? If, and if we do, we feel like we're going to be kind of more like roadkill, right? We're bruised and battered by the time that we get there, rather than you're like running down the, the highway of, of holiness. It's almost as if God wants us to make sure that we realize that the only way that we get to the resurrection destination is by being hoisted atop the cross and dying with Jesus. Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. Now, I want to first make sure that we're all kind of on the same page with regard to who Abraham and Sarah, or Abram and Sarai, whatever you want to call them, who they actually were. So Abraham and Sarah are Adam and Eve 3.0. So let me explain how this works. So if you kind of, you kind of step back from the page of Genesis 12, and, and you kind of get the broad sweep of, of salvation history... What you see throughout this history, popping up kind of here and there, are couples, husbands and wives who serve as Adams and Eves. They're, they're bearers and proclaimers of the promise 
that held them captive. So to our first parents, Adam, dirt man, and Eve, rib woman, to them, God gave this promise. Really, it's like, it's the good news. And he gave it to them on the day they needed it the most. Genesis 3.15. I'll read in English for all of you. I will put, I'm going to insert a little Hebrew. I will put a va. We usually translate that enmity. I kind of like the word hostility. It has a little more edge to it. I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall shuf your head. That's the Hebrew verb. He shall shuf your head and you shall shuf his heel. Strike or something like that, bruise, same verb. He shall, he shall strike your head and you shall strike his heel. Now, don't miss this. This is the so-called proto-evangelion, which is just a fancy word for, for the first gospel. And it's preached, did you get that? It's preached directly to the devil. I love that. I love it because it's a great thing to keep in mind that when you are proclaiming the gospel, you're kicking the devil where it hurts. To preach the gospel is simultaneously to, to mock hell and to sneer at Satan and to spit in the face of death, all the same time you're pouring life and forgiveness and salvation into the ears and the hearts of sinners. So nothing is worse news for the devil than the good news of Jesus. So this Zerah of the woman, seed or sperm or however you want to translate it, the seed of the woman, he's going to boot the head of that lying serpent while the serpent sticks his fangs into the heel of this seed. Well, looky there. We're not three and a half chapters into the Bible before. On the horizon, we can see the contours of a Roman cross. And don't you just love the fact that God wastes no time in proclaiming the gospel to Adam and Eve when they needed it the most. It wasn't like he said they had to enter into a period of penance and he was gonna stick his little spiritual thermometer into their heart to see if they had warmed up enough to genuine repentance. And then he was gonna approach them and give them a few words of hope. No, like a good preacher, God walks right up. He calls a spade a spade. He gives them a little law and then he lays the gospel on thick. Now, just so we're clear, this is the promise that held Adam and Eve captive. The gospel of booting and biting, the gospel of venom injecting and head crushing. So right away, we know that the gospel is gonna be a deadly and, and a bloody and a saving business. It's also a business that's focused on the seed. And this is kind of interesting because the only way that we're going to perpetuate, carry on this, this promise of the seed is by women, men and women having sex. I think like a pretty good idea. You got to have babies, right? You got to have men and women having sex, having babies, carrying on the promise of this seed. But even that's not enough because it's got to be, it's got to be preached. It's got to be proclaimed. An unknown promise doesn't do anyone any good. So that means that you have to have people who proclaim and pass on this promise. So God always makes sure that there's an Adam and an Eve around to do that. So first we have our original Adam and Eve. And next we have Adam and Eve 2.0, and that's Noah and Mrs. Noah. <laughs> there they are, coming out of, of a creation that's recently been, been cleansed. It's kind of like a new creation. They come out of the ark, which was a floating garden, garden of Eden. So now you have a new Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve 2.0, surrounded by, by all these animals. Now, of course, the Lord is starting over. It's not with a completely fresh slate, but he is regenesising the world. Now, I want you to think back to early this morning when you got up around four o'clock, any good student of the Torah, and you, you read those first 11 chapters of Genesis in Hebrew. I want you to just remember. I know it's been a few hours, but it's kind of, what did you see? What did, what did you see when you read that? Well, you, you see Noah, he, he disembarks. He decides he's going to grow some, some, some vines. So he plants some vines. He grows those, and pretty soon he's got some wine, and 
he ties one on one day, has a little bit too much. And uh, he, somehow he passes out drunk inside his, his tent, and then his son comes in, and he sees him, you know, in his birthday suit, and he goes out and he blabs to his brothers. And next thing you know, Adam wakes up. I don't know if he has a hangover or not, but he wakes up, and he goes out, and the, <laughs> the first recorded words of Noah, not that whole story, not a single word of Noah is recorded. The first recorded words of Noah are, Arur Kana'an, cursed be Canaan. Not a really great way to start. So here we are. It's like Genesis 3 all over again, right? You got nakedness. You got family division. You got sin. You got shame. Again. And then you turn the page to Genesis chapter 10. You got the so-called table of nations. The, the 70 nations. 70 is the symbolic word in Judaism and in the Bible for all the nations of the world. You have that. And then, and then you have the Tower of Confusion. You have the Tower of Babel. I think we talked about that in Arkansas. It's a ziggurat. It's half finished. It's an emblem of humanity's failed attempt to kind of decide how they want to have union with God. Now, now here we are in these first few chapters of Genesis. Now, let, let's say that you're God, Okay which for most of us is not that big of a struggle because it's kind of our <laughs> standard operating procedure. Let's say you're God, and you're looking out over Genesis 1 through 11. Now, what do you see? Well, it's, it's a cosmic train wreck, right? Satan, the god of this world, has, just made, has had a heyday with humanity. I mean, it's, it's not like we have some sort of moral evolution going on, right? So post-flood sinners are exactly the same as pre-flood sinners. Then you have this hubris that's baked into this half-finished tower of confusion. And we know from later biblical narratives, Dan quoted Joshua 24 last night, that chapter tells us that the, the worship of other, other gods has, has spread, okay? So you're looking out over this mess of Genesis 1 through 11, and what are you going to do? Well, me, if I were God, got this figured out. I know exactly what I'd do. I'd call my best and my brightest angels. They'd be like, come here. Gabriel, Michael, Uriel, uh, I got a job for you guys. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to, to, to kind of go out and check out humanity. Here's what I'm looking for. I want a couple that's about 20 to 25 years of age, no older than 30, okay? I want them to come from good Bible-believing, church-going families. Um, I'm kind of looking for really for three things. I want youth, I want uh, fertility, and I want fidelity. Okay, you got it? Good, all right, go. That's the way I'd solve this problem. But God, <laughs> no surprise here, he's got other plans. God looks out over the vast sweep of humanity and he passes over every 20 to 25 year old couple and instead he chooses a 75 year old dude and a 65-year-old woman. <laughs> and as if that's not kind of weird enough, he makes sure <laughs> that they're not only husband and wife, they're brother and sister. <laughs> well, I mean, they're half brother and sister, but really, does it matter all that much? 75, 65, husband, wife, slash brother, sister. Okay, well, maybe at least they come from like good church-going, Bible-believing families. Oh, no. Now, we read also in Joshua 24 this. Long ago, your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, and they served other gods. Wow. So let's get this straight. First, Adam and Eve are created perfect. Okay? Uh, Noah, we, we read, is, is righteous. He was blameless in his generation, and Noah walked with God. Now we get to Adam and Eve 3.0, the couple that are chosen to have sex and make babies and perpetuate and pass on this, this promise of the seed. And, and the Lord selects an elderly couple who are obviously past the point of childbearing. They have a sort of incestuous marriage, and they grew up worshiping false gods. It's perfect. Perfect. <laughs> it's about right. So Abraham went forth not knowing where he was going, but you got to wonder, did God? <laughs> no. He kind of know where he was going with this because it's not really looking good, you know. And he, Abraham believed God, reckoned him as righteous. But you got to wonder at times if Abraham wondered too where God was going with, with all of this. 
Well, if Abraham had been so blessed as to have known Martin Luther, <laughs> then uh, Martin Luther would have probably put his hand on Abraham's shoulder, pulled him a, a, a tall stein of German beer, and said, Abe, don't you worry yourself not about this. Let me tell you, when God begins something, it always seems as if nothing is going to come of it. So when God began this thing, what happened? Well, the promise that he gave to Adam and Eve that was passed on to Noah and Mrs. Noah is now slipped into the pocket of this couple. So this is the beginning of Genesis 12. God said to Abraham, lech lecha in Hebrew, get yourself going. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and he who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the gospel of the Lord. I was wondering if I was going to get that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks be to God. And I really do mean this is the gospel. I know it is. Because listen to what Paul says in Galatians 3. He says the scripture, which of course is always the Old Testament, because in the Bible, when the Bible talks about the Bible, the Bible is the Old Testament. So the scripture, amen, brother. When the scripture said, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, pro you angelizomai, pre preached the gospel, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. How? Saying, in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's the gospel. So Abram becomes the next link in this the long chain of gospel promises extending from Genesis 3.15 to Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. But now we have, as soon as we kind of get into the life of Abraham, Genesis 12 and onward, we got a weird kind of, I think whiplash is kind of the best way to think about it. It's just back and forth, back and forth between you'll have a promise and then you'll have something endangering that promise. And then you'll have promise repeated, something endangering that promise. Just think about it. No sooner does God call Abraham and Sarah out of where they were to the promised land than a famine threatens their lives. They got to run down to Egypt. While they're there, Abraham says, you know what would be a good idea? If I told Pharaoh and anybody else who asked that Sarah was my sister. Half true, half lie. We know what happens then, right? Sarah ends up in Pharaoh's household. Well, God brings them out of that situation. They come back. And no sooner does that happen before their, lot, who, before their nephew, Lot, who made the, the worst real estate decision ever. <laughs> he bought, like, property in Sodom. Well, he gets taken as a POW, and Abraham's life is at risk because he's got to go rescue Lot. Well, God rescues Abraham out of that, brings him back safely, and next thing you know, whiplash again because... Sarah comes up with this great idea of having her husband sleep with her maidservant. That always works out well. <laughs> so Hagar enters the scene. We know that blew up in their face. Well, it's back and forth, back and forth, this whiplash until finally, finally, 25 years have passed. And Yitzhak, laughter, Isaac is finally born. Have you ever been in one of those seasons in life where you feel like after a really, really long time of, of waiting and struggle, and maybe at times feeling like you're, you're, just got, you're hanging by a thread, when finally you feel like you can breathe again, and not just breathe again, but, but smile, and not, not smile a little, but a lot. And it, it kind of feels surreal, but, but it is real, and it's so real that you're laughing, but also you're, you're kind of crying at the same time because your emotions are all mixed up, because you feel like you finally past beyond that, that period of, of waiting, and now you can rejoice, you can laugh. You sort of made it. You can smile again. I think that maybe that's kind of where Abraham and Sarah were after 25 years of waiting, and finally, their baby boy is here. Despite all appearances to the contrary, despite the their, their idol-worshiping ways when they were growing up, despite their weird brother-sister marriage, despite, despite Pharaoh and Hagar and all these various things that were a setback, despite the fact, I love that Paul says, yeah, Abraham was as good as dead. <laughs> and Sarah's womb, well, that was dead too. 
despite all of these things, which made it appear as if when God began this, nothing would come of it, well, finally something did come of it. And they have this little baby boy who's sucking his thumb, and they're watching him begin to, to walk, and the next thing you know, he's a toddler, and then, he's a, and then he's, a, he's a young man. I love how the Bible says they were fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Isn't that beautiful? They were fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised, and so he had. And they could breathe and laugh and look forward to the future with Isaac for the rest of their lives. Until, so one day Abraham's phone rang. It's like, it's God calling. I wonder what he wants. And if I can kind of pull upon a little bit of Jewish tradition in Bereshit Rabbah and, and maybe modernize it a little bit, I imagine the conversation went something like this. Abraham? Yeah, God, here. Take your son. Well, actually, God, I have two sons. Uh, I got Isaac and then I got Ishmael, your only son. Well, I mean, I want to get too technical here, but I, I mean, Isaac is my only son with Sarah, and Ishmael is my only son with, with Hagar, whom you love. Well, there's not like it's a limit to my affections. I mean, I love both. I love both, I love both my sons, yeah. And then a little pause, and God's like, Isaac. What about Isaac? And then God says, take him to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And with that, click, God hung up the phone. Now, people throughout the ages have always been stunned and pretty freaked out by this command of God, and, and I'm certainly among those. But you know what, what stuns me almost more Almost more is the fact that Abraham does not breathe a word of protest. I mean, this is the guy, keep in mind, this is the guy that interceded for Sodom. You know the, what if there's 50 righteous people in there? What, 45, 40, 30, 20, 10? Yeah. What if there's 10 righteous people? This guy who, who, who interceded for Sodom does not, does not breathe a single word of protest or intercession for his son. I mean, he could have said, Far be it from you, Lord. Far be it from you that the judge of all the earth did not do what is right. He could have said, Lord, you promised that from my very body would come forth a, a seed and that I would have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the, on the seashore. And how's that going to happen if the stars wink down malici maliciously upon the the sacrificed body of my son. Lord, ha have mercy on me. Have mercy on my wife. We'll die of a broken heart. Abraham could have said any of that. But instead, he gets up in the morning, pours himself a cup of coffee, saddles his donkey, chops some firewood, and gets two servants and Isaac and heads to the land of Moriah. How he did that, I don't know, but I do know it was certainly not by his own reason or strength, but by faith in the God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Just like when the Lord called him out of Ur and he went not knowing where he was going, so he went not knowing what would happen to his son, but he knew one thing. He knew that God cannot lie. And if God had promised him that he was going to have seed as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless on the, as the sand on the seashore, then the God who cannot lie was evidently going to raise his son from the very dust of the earth. That, I think, paints before our eyes what it means for the patriarchs to be held captive by the promises of God. You know, I think there, there comes a point there comes a point in every believer's life when we realize we had everything backwards. We thought that we were holding on to the promises of God when all the while the promises of God were holding on to us. 
We thought that we were striding down the highway of holiness while all the time we, unholy sinners, were being born on the shoulders of the Holy One of God. We thought we were, we were holding fast to the, the promises of Christ while all the while, no, no, those promises had us held fast. We were bound to the body of Jesus Christ, baptized into him. We co-die and we're co-buried with him and we were promised that we'll be raised to life with him as well. So there comes a point in, every life, in everyone's life where God is like, you silly Christian. You never had a single thing to do with it. It was all done for you by Jesus Christ. Yeah, for a while, God kind of lets you carry on your little silly semi-Pelagian game of thinking that you have some skin in the game. And now you awake to the reality that, oh, it was Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus the entire time who was saving me and holding on to me. Speaking of Jesus, you know, one time he had that cryptic saying. He said, Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. Remember this? Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. I like to think that it was on Mount Moriah that Abraham rejoiced that he would see the day of Jesus, that bound up in the body of his son in some way was the, the shadowy image of the seed who was to come. That when he looked into the face of that seed, Isaac, he saw the face of the promised seed, Jesus Christ. That he saw on that altar of stones, the altar of the cross. And that he saw in his own uplifted blade, the spear and the nails and the thorns that would pierce through the one who was to come. And, and he saw the empty tomb where the only thing buried there is the crushed head of the serpent. And while Abraham was seeing all of this, he heard that beautiful voice saying, stop, stop, don't touch that boy. Now, this was the messenger of the Lord, whom, if you know anything about my stuff, you know that I believe is the son of the father. Who better to stop the sacrifice than the one for whom the sacrifice would not be stopped? Who better than the son of the father to say, stop, I'm gonna take care of the sacrifice. It won't be a, it won't be a knife, but it'll be thorns and a spear and a nail which go into me. I'll be the lamb who's tangled up in the thicket of crucifixion. I'll be the one who receives the death that brings all of you life. So these are the, these are the whiplash moments in the life of Abraham. We have a promise and then you have a threat and a promise and a threat and a promise and a threat. And then finally, finally the promise is actually born and God says, kill him. And then God says, stop. It's like, back and forth, back and forth. It's like the, the minute you kind of think you're true at the end, God says, oh, no, 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 we're just, we're just getting started. Now, he's not known for uh, being a theologian, but the, the Western novelist, Louis L'Amour, <laughs> guy I grew up reading, uh, has this to say. This is in the 17th of his Sackett series, which I recently reread. I read them all as a boy, and I reread them all. Uh, a few weeks ago. And this is the opening line of his last novel in the Sackett series. There will come a time when you believe everything is finished. That will be the beginning. There was a time atop that lonely mountain of Moriah when it looked as if everything was finished for Isaac. And that was just the beginning. There was a time atop the, the lonely mountain of, of crucifixion, when everybody, including his own disciples, thought that it was all finished. Wrong. Isaac lived on. Jesus crucified, rose again, and lives on. Like all of you, I too know a thing or two about the whiplash way that our Lord works in our lives. 
after what I usually refer to as my dark years. When, like Dan was saying last night, I, I decided that I didn't want to belong to God. <laughs> well, my life fell apart and uh, did a lot of things of which I'm now ashamed. And so God thought what would be best for me is to stick my broken soul inside the cab of a truck for 13 years. And then I started having you know, little windows open up here and there where I could, you know, speak and write. And then uh, early in 2019, I got a call from Scott Keith and asked if I'd be interested in, in working full-time for, for 15, 17. So at that time, I, I kind of felt like probably Abraham and Sarah did after all those 25 years of waiting. It's kind of like I, I could smile again and I could, I, could, I could breathe again. Like the dark days were, were over. And then July 16th came. And I got a call from the, the commandant of the United States Naval Academy. And he said, Mr. Bird. I said, yes. He said, father of midshipman Luke Bird. I said, yes. He said, Mr. Bird, I have some, I have some news for you. And as you probably all know, that news, at least initially, initially, was that uh, my son, my only son whom I love, was missing. He had fallen from this tall, tall waterfall, a cliff right beside it. And, and I went from breathing and smiling and laughing to wondering if life would ever be the same. About 24 hours later, we found out that uh, Luke, one of the most competitive people that I've ever known, had gone and won the race ahead of everybody else. And it beat us all to heaven. Almost prophetically, several years ago, when he was confirmed, he wrote an essay in which he described that he knew that in life he would stumble and fall, but he knew that there would always be warm hands at the bottom to catch him. And they did. They were warm hands that bore the stigmata of crucifixion, and they caught Luke. And then the angels carried him like Lazarus to the bosom of Abraham. Now, I got to admit, this father is more than a little jealous of Father Abraham right now. But I know that Luke is safe and sound with him. And more importantly, I know that Luke is safe and sound with the seed who had lifted up his heel and crushed the head of the serpent. For Luke, for me, for all of you, that one who I imagine stepped forth from the tomb on the morning of his resurrection with a huge smile on his face because he knew that he had just reconciled the world to his father. And me, well, I'm still stuck here with the rest of you poor, miserable sinners. <laughs> Walking this ridiculously circuitous route that we call life, knowing where we're going, but not knowing what in the world we're going to face while we're on the way there. Today, maybe feeling like we're going to make it. Tomorrow, thinking, I don't know if we're going to make it or not. All the while, the seed of Eve who became the seed of Mary is saying to us, oh, you're going to make it. I'm going to make sure that I get you there. So don't let anybody say, I'm so dead inside that I'll never make it because Christ is your life. Don't let anybody say, I've got so many sins that I'll never make it. Oh, whatever. Your sin, <laughs> your sin is no longer your own. It belongs to Jesus, and he ain't giving it back. And don't let anybody say, I don't believe enough. Christ has trusted perfectly in your stead. So... Don't let anybody say my shame is too hard or my grief is too hard or life is too hard or it just feels like I can't really hold on to the promises of God any longer. Good. Good. Now you realize, now you realize that it was never up to you anyway. 
not on your good days, not on your bad days, not on your worst of days, was getting to the heavenly Jerusalem ever up to you. It was always Christ and Christ alone. So let me tell you, when it feels like your life has just kind of become a bunch of rubble and you're kind of hollowed out on the inside by the chopping acts of pain and it feels like you, you just can't hold on to anything to save your life, don't worry. The champion of life, the resurrected Christ, he's got you. And you, my friend, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and St. Luke, you're held captive by the promises of God. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you.